show you a picture, brother. Okay. And you must just give me your feelings. Okay. Right. Okay. Let me open it up. <laughs> this is like a massive surprise going on. I'm not sure what picture you're going to show me. Here is the picture right here. Oh, look. I'll, 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 I'll put it up on screen for everybody to see. Okay. Got you. <laughs> awesome, man. Obviously, that's you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. The guy on the far left over there. Okay. And that's Ramon? That's right, yeah. Okay. The, 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 the dancer? The dancer, yeah. I'm not going to ask you basically where they are and what they're doing. Yeah. Because this, this, this is about you. Okay, thank you. Okay, man. this is about you. Yeah, everybody, everybody, credit, credit to, to to all of those guys, eh? And everybody else that's still with me on the journey. Yeah, they play a very important role in my life in terms of how you know my character and personality have been um, shaped and cultivated through the years. Otherwise, I would have been a lost cause yes. you know, if it weren't for the people that we've seen in the pics. For these guys, <laughs> absolutely. Me personally, I'll tell you who I've met. Okay, I've met you, obviously. Yeah. I've met Ramon, okay. very interesting character. <laughs> of course. Uh, your lead rapper, I, I, have, I haven't met. Yeah, that's Shane right there. I've met Ishmael. Yes, Mr. Morabi. And I've met Mabokot. Ah, here we go. Juliet I've met them. <laughs> so now, you've influenced them in different ways, and they've influenced you in different ways. I mean, um, we know Mabokot ended up being in Boom Shaka. Yes. Ishmael ended up being in Ski. Uh, Ramon used to dance for you. And, and and you still, you you still the grandmaster. People still know you as a grandmaster. I remember back in Joburg, if we had to throw an event and DJ Ready P was there, that place would be sold out. And I'd like to thank you. Wow, man! Thank you for so that. Much. Thank you because, so much. Because uh, I'm a hip hop head. I consider myself a hip hop head. I've been a hip hop head since the late eighties. Wow. wow. And I remember um, watching, it. I, I think it was on Toyota Top 20 or something, it was on TV2, yeah. uh, 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 Bob Mabena and Melanie Sun. Yes. Bob Mabena, the late Bob Mabena and, 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 and Melanie Sun. And, 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 um, and a track of yours, a POC track uh, uh, came on and I was like, what's happening in Cape Town? Why isn't Joburg doing this? You know? And, and Cape Town was like, was the pinnacle of hip hop at that time. I mean, you had, you had Black Noise, you had POC. I mean, if, if you needed the best B-boys uh, to come to your event, you had to get a guy from Cape Town. Yeah, yeah you know? I, remember, I remember that era, yeah. And, and the guys, the guys in Cape Town, for me, this is, this is personally for me, it's not, you guys, you can tell me in the comments if I'm talking rubbish. <laughs> but for me personally, I thought that Joburg was sleeping. Because the hip hop culture in Joburg was more an exclusive culture. You know, uh, people used to make fun of us. They used to make fun of the way we dress. They used to say that we want to be Americans. Mm, mm. They used to call us punks. Yeah. Even though they didn't know what the definition of punk was. I mean, I used to get laughed at uh, when I got a pair of Dr. Martens and baggy jeans. And people used to laugh at my shoes. They said you. that I used to wear shoes for <laughs> crippled people. We, 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 we had to people. endure the same level of ignorance. You know? eh? Yeah, we had to go through that ourselves. You know, but I mean, if you look at the culture, because I, I, I saw the progression of the culture, then, then people started having a liking to hip hop. But what, what I saw from POC is that they, they localized hip-hop. They, they weren't, uh, you guys weren't mimicking exactly what the Americans were doing at that time. Yeah. But you, you, you gave it, most of the Cape Town guys at that time, you gave it a Cape Townian feel. Am, am I correct? I would say at that time, yes, we, we, we did give it that feel, but that wasn't intentional. Mm. We were just using the, I would say, the influences and the principles of hip hop culture came through the music. Mm. So when we put the music together, especially mm -hmm. with the first album, you'll hear there's Cape Town traditional flavors in yeah. there. 
you'll hear Abdullah Ibrahim's yes. um, influence come through. You'll hear, if you want to call it sort of like um, the traditional South African music style and sound mm. coming through, even bordering through to Northeast West African mm. music also coming through because we, in our heads, our understanding of hip hop music was all about trying to do something that's different and that's original and that's creative and always pushing the boundaries mm -hmm. and we were like but wow man look at all these americans all these producers are sampling james brown parliament you know all the mm. usual suspects yeah. nothing wrong with them but that's their culture mm. so we were like wow look at the pool of music that we can access in this country and on this continent mm. let's see you know how hip-hop we can get with sampling our own yes our own sound and hopefully the world will latch onto it and when we go out into the world we'll have a sound and we'll have a look and a feel and a dance and a swagger that will be different to anybody else's on the planet and that's what happened we started to sample the music apart from sampling we had a lot of live instrumentation coming into the music as well mm -hmm. and of course we choreographed the dance to it as yes. well you know so it looked different and the way we were dressed we were influenced by so many different if you want to call it african yes. flavors and sauces and all these different things and we had gumbo dancing mm. mixed with b-boying never ever seen or heard in the world yes. before and when we eventually took the world stage i mean the world couldn't get enough of profits of the city because of that and yes. it came with a very strong political message as well because of the times that we were living in and the whole world were out there protesting and fighting and you know siding with South Africa and we were all out there uh, calling for Mandela and all these other political prisoners uh, freedoms and we were calling for democracy and we were you know all over the world mm. doing um, these types of things so I mean that that's kind of what that was all about we didn't know how far it was gonna go we didn't know how big we were gonna blow up as well and we did not know that one day Kaifa Semenyo was going to take you to meet Quincy Jones and mm. you're going to perform at the Montreal Jazz Festival. Nice. And our first big international show was in Swaziland. I'll never forget that one. 30,000 people in the audience. Nice. Freaking losing their minds. Nice. Then you find yourself on the plane in Montreal. Then later on, you're based in the UK and then your biggest fan base is as far north as you possibly can go. All the way in Norway, in a little town called Trondheim, yeah. that's over a yeah. thousand years old, you're getting invited to the, how do you say, to a celebrationary um, festival that yeah. celebrates the thousandth anniversary of a Viking town. How's that? You know what I mean? For irony. And you come in from Southern Africa and you're as militant and as black as you can be, yeah. but the whitest country on planet yeah. Earth. You end up there. Yeah, because you guys were prophets, man. <laughs> <laughs> you were prophets. When I think you know, about it, it's you, quite crazy. You, you were prophesizing. The, the you know? other crazy story i got to tell you, though, before the Berlin Wall came down, we yeah. actually had a gig in East Berlin. So yeah. we saw what happened on the other side of the wall. I and mean, we even had Nazis as bodyguards. Can wow. you believe it? Wow. At the gig we did in East Berlin. Wow. That's how crazy it was for Prophets of the City and the places that we end up being. So it wasn't just a hip-hop festival, it wasn't just a hip-hop gig, you yeah. know. Then you're performing with Native Americans, yes. then you're with Lauren Hill and the Fugees, yes. and then you were James Brown, and then you were with Ice-T and Public Enemy, and you know, it was a complete, how do you say, broad dynamic. Yes. And I think all of those events, of course, influenced who I've become as an individual as well. And having that experience and travel the world, you have a co completely different perspective of what goes on in your country yeah. and in your community as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for all of those journeys. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I met a really wise man. I'm not going to mention any names, but he said if, if he had the same amount of money that Bill Gates had, he would pay for every kid to travel. Absolutely. He would pay for every child to travel, to see the world, to have a broad uh, perspective yes on life and uh, and i'm glad that you went through that that uh, that journey you know and um speaking about the berlin wall and and that time and mandela came out of jail yeah and you guys had a very famous <laughs> song <laughs> excellent oh, excellent finally a black president there we go man. yeah Never again. Never again. Never again. But look where we're right. now. <laughs> Never again. Yeah. You know, you, you met the man. Did you meet the man? We met the man and 
two occasions. Met the band, yeah. And the man even jammed with us and danced nice. with us in Kailicha on the sports field. Nice. And I was even chased by the man's, <laughs> uh, what do you call them? The, the entourage. The whole entourage. entourage yeah. I was chased by the entourage. Yeah. Because I rolled in in Kailicha with my Ford Cortina 30S. Yes. Coming and cruising in, you yeah. know, because the car was low. Of course, it's got to be low. Yeah. As I came into the stadium, I look in the mirror and I hear people clapping hands and screaming and shouting and there's blue lights and black <laughs> vehicles and people are like hi 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 and I was like what the hell I put my foot down and I'm here, <laughs> over the grass with my 30 S and Mandela and the entourage is behind me. Anyway, there we are. Park the car, wait for the rest of the crew to arrive. I was the first one to be there. We performed, you know, uh, we did our performance. Madiba come, came on stage. He was doing his Madiba the jive. Dance, yeah. He stood for a pick with the Prophets of the City yeah. and that became the world famous photo of POC and Madiba yeah. and we used that in our vote education campaign. Nice. Yeah, so that was the, the first encounter. And of course we performed at his inauguration nice. as well. And that came with lots of controversy. Yeah. No, but controversy is good. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, there's no such thing as bad publicity, <laughs> you know. And uh, Ishmael. Ishmael <laughs> killed that Mandela dance, man, <laughs> in that music video. Yes. You know, <laughs> he totally destroyed nice. it. <laughs>